man who knows his racing. So I was going to ask you for the next couple of minutes about the money in uh, racing. I've no real sense of it. If you, if you told me they were earning millions and millions, I'd believe it. If you told me they were just getting by and would have to all work after they retire, I would believe that too. And maybe, yeah. maybe that, is, that it is a cross-section in racing more than other sports. I think the reason... Um like the Sean Maguire thing, for example, people would be wondering oh, how much is Sean on a press and all that. And it's like, I remember Richie Sadler spoke about this before, where he was like, I was, all, I was always thinking, like, if you're on 60 grand a week, why would you care about being on 65? But it's actually, well, I do care if the guy beside me is on 70, mm. and I think I'm better than him. And that was Richie's basic point. I was like, okay, I kind of see where you're coming from. But that doesn't really exist in racing because everyone gets kind of paid the same. So it's very egalitarian in that sense. Um, and what happens is if you win your race, you get 10% of the prize money, less a small percentage, I think, which goes to um, kind of workers in the, in the game. Um, but you actually get a riding fee just for riding the horse. That's, I think it's 157 euro. So if you turn up and Ruby Walsh turns up and you're a professional, you're both getting 157 quid, give or take, or whatever it is. Yeah. Currently just for riding that race? Yeah, not, not, notwithstanding if Ruby has a separate arrangement, um, I'm not sure if he has, but if you were to look at jockeys who are riding, like Andrew Lynch would have, what would he have a year? Like he would have five, 500 rides a year, maybe something like that. Mm. You know, he's getting 157 per. So basically you can earn quite a decent wage and then Tony McCoy would surely have been on a retainer with J.P. McManus, and mm. I presume Barry Garrity as well. That's fine, you know. That was a kind of a lucrative, like high-profile so job. The percentage of jockeys who were on retainers would be very small. Would it? I'd be like pittance. A handful. A handful. Okay. Um, so you can almost discount them from the median talk. You can, yeah. So the the median talk. So if you're say there are a lot of jockeys in Ireland who are struggling, like they, you know, they can't really get winners, but they're not really struggling financially. Right. Now, the flip side of that is, it's a bloody tough game. You know, you're up really early, um, you're doing a lot of travelling if you're, if you're particularly freelance. Um, it's extremely dangerous. Mm. You know, like it's probably the only sport where an ambulance fo follows you around in your combat. And um, you're going to break a lot of bones. You may well lose your life. Mm -hmm. Thinking JT McNamara, Kieran Kelly. Mm. Um, thinking Sean, uh, Sean Cleary. Um, and obviously, if you're if you're paralysed from the neck down, like befall so many of them, your your life is suffering an awful lot. Um, but but in terms of the actual money you make and for how healthy it is as as a pursuit, it's actually it's actually a decent job. Mm. But as you mentioned earlier, if you're one of the staff in racing, you work horrible hours for bad money, very bad money. And the only reason they do it, in my view, is because they kind of can't see the wood from the trees in the sense that horses is all they know. And I mean that in the nicest possible way. They love horses. They love horses. They love working with horses and they're often ill-educated. Mm. So it's a, um, I guess it's almost a vocation. They love being around horses. They want to see the horses do well. They want to see the stable do well. Money is not their primary objective. No, it's not. Um, you know, and it, it's a tricky one for me, we'll say, as a racing journalist, like, I would be all for the welfare of the stable staff because I think they're literally indispensable like they, mm. they and they'll often go to like a race meeting and they'll be charged like two two fifty for like you know a bad sandwich and like they, they just get kind of they, they, they don't get pro I don't think they're properly represented being honest with you in Ireland I, I think the Irish Sable Staff Association really could do a better job right um, and I think a lot of Sable Staff will tell you that um, when you mentioned the price of a crap cup of coffee or a crap sandwich I see that on Twitter quite a bit actually from jockeys yeah. or staff just highlighting how poor that aspect of things is at Irish race courses. And bear in mind now, these race courses are getting like sort of 30, 40 grand a, a meeting on TV rights money alone. And in fact, it's a lot more than that in some cases. So mm. they are getting plenty of money. And the, the, the thing about the problem with it, though, in terms of stable staff and Ruby Walsh actually called for before some of the TV rights money to go into or to, to go to, to stable staff. The problem for trainers in terms of paying wages, is that trainers really aren't making money. Like well, I was going to say, so aside from, I suppose, uh, I mean, Mullins seems to be open to anyone. So, you know, any kind of syndicate, the, you know, lads who pool their money together and also very wealthy owners, Mullins is open to working with both and he's doing very well. And then you've Gordon Elliott as well, who might be more towards the wealthy owner side of things. Beyond those two, what's the general health of things for Irish trainers? 
Well, strangely enough, uh, Gordon's actually significantly cheaper training fees than, than Willie. Um, right. Now, obviously, you, you'll recall that Willie's... The Ryanair thing. The, Ry the Ryanair oh, sorry, thing. The Michael O'Leary thing. Still have slight reservations about whether it was the uh, five pound... I think it was a five euro a day uh, increase being the actual reason for the split, but that's for another day. But Gordon is significantly um, less expensive and... I actually sent a horse to Willie Mullins lately, and I was like, have I budgeted for this at all? He's expensive. He's very expensive. He's very good. He's unbelievably good. Yeah. And I just kind of wanted, we, I was involved with a horse before, and the horse was, lit, was no good. Like So I wanted to see what the crack would be, and hopefully you'd, you'd get the reward out of it. But Gordon would make a more compelling case in terms of how good he is, mm. and he's less expensive. But then you, you go to the lads who are like 30 euro a day, um, and that's just not economical. And you know, a lot of the trainers want us to be brought in. That um, as in thirty euro a day is not economical from their point of view. Not, not at all. It's just not economical. Um, I, I can't really get into it. But in terms of the cost of bedding and feed, and you know, f basically housing the horses and paying staff, and yeah, it's not economical. And uh, a lot of trainers, like I'd say, ninety percent of trainers are basically making nothing. Like um, right, and that that puts a lot of emphasis on, on maybe landing a gamble here and there as well and you know um, I guess a lot of them are under pressure but it basically means the long and the short of it is they're not going to be paying their staff very very much. Mm, okay. Um, and, and has it always been thus? Um, yeah pretty much although there, there are now so many like there are 370 odd trainers there about so they say there are about 20,000 people employed in the racing industry in some shape or form. Now Horse Racing Ireland will usually put the, the bright side up um, with those figures but um, there are there are a huge number of staff, and and in fairness, they're key to rural Ireland because you know, if you we're caught in a Dublin bubble much of the time, yeah. And if you go to much of rural Ireland, it's still in recession really. There's been no, I mean, if you look at house prices in certain parts of Ireland, they really haven't gone up at all. Like, um, if they've gone up, it's kind of a pittance. So if you've a stable, if you've a yard like in. Say Pat Kelly has a yard in East Galway, and you know if you look at the yards in Kilkenny, Carlow, um, lots of yards in sort of the in, even in the Midlands, Tipperary, they're really really vital for that local area. Um, but the staff, are staff going to keep? And 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 this is another point actually. Aidan O'Brien gets kind he kind of gets mocked because after race he say, listen, thanks to um, yeah, thanks to Pat and. And, and Alan at home will look after him mm. and they're like oh here we go blah 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 he wants them to be recognised though he wants to laud them publicly because he knows it's very bloody hard to get staff and yeah. there's another problem down the line humans are getting taller um, so jockeys are going to be getting um, less and less plentiful in Ireland and in America now most jockeys are Latin American because I think they're actually genetically a little bit smaller mm. this is going to be a problem as well but by God we're going to have a problem with staff I mean and, and, and the beauty of racing is about half the staff are girls or women. And I, I think that's fantastic. I think racing never gets the credit it deserves for, for how, how women are just so pivotal to the sport. Mm. But as they get better educated, it's not going to be life that's going to... It's, it's the biggest problem for racing going forward or going backwards. Right. Um, to kind of clash with the, 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 the buzzword is going to get to be getting staff. Mm. Um, not so much... Not so much jockeys, I think. I think jockeys will be fine, and yeah. we still love racing this country, but staff do horrible hours for bad money, and they're poorly represented in terms of union.